Hi, my name is Kali Fajardo Anstein, and I'm the author of Sabrina and Karina. I'm here in Denver, Colorado, and I'm at my apartment right now. Um, my writing desk is actually right in front of the computer, and I'm over in my reading nook. Sabrina and Karina is a collection of 11 short stories that are all focused on the lives of Latinas of indigenous ancestry who are from Colorado and northern New Mexico. Um, my book comes out of my background and my family history here in the American West, and it comes out of issues that I saw growing up. A lot of Sabrina and Karina focuses on violence against women, abandonment, gentrification, and a number of other themes that were really close to home and things that I saw in my own neighborhoods and I experienced. Um, Sabrina and Karina, all the stories are focused either in Denver, where my family has lived now for five generations, or they take place in Se Juanita, Colorado, which is a fictional town that I invented in Southern Colorado in order to set stories in the land of my ancestors. My ancestors migrated north to Denver in the 1930s. One of my great grandfathers, Alfonso, is from the Philippines. One of my grandmothers is Jewish from the east side of Denver. And my great grandmother is indigenous and Mexican. And I grew up with this incredible mixture of cultures and histories and this sort of convergence of the American West. Um, but I never, ever saw any stories like ours in American literature. And I wanted to make sure that I put our stories into books. And when I was a little girl, I decided that I wanted to become a writer. I started studying literature. I started working at a bookstore in Denver called Westside Books, an antiquarian and rare bookstore. And I studied English at Metropolitan State University of Denver. And that's really where these stories began. I started writing about my old neighborhoods, Denver's West Side, Denver's North Side, Five Points. And some of my stories are actually even set on campus at Metro State where I went. I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I, I come from, I have six siblings. I have five sisters and one brother. And I had this incredibly large Wild West family. I knew my great grandmother, I knew her sisters, I knew my great uncles, and everybody and all the cousins, everybody was around Denver when I was growing up. Um, and they told us stories about where they came from and my great, great grandparents. But when I would go to school, I wouldn't see any of us um, depicted in the history textbooks. I didn't see our lives or our histories in literature. And this had a huge effect on the way that I viewed myself and my family. And it had a huge effect on my self-esteem. I actually dropped out of high school. I've struggled with depression most of my life. And a lot of those issues had to do with not feeling good about myself. So one of the things that I try to do with my writing is to make sure that I'm centering the lives of young women and girls and older women, any, anybody who comes from my experiences and I'm trying to make sure that our lives are visible and we felt seen and that our voices are heard. I grew up listening to stories constantly and these stories, they normally were short in length even if their tales were epic. Um, and the reason that they were short is simply because they were told in the living room or at the kitchen table or in the backyard. Um, and we didn't have time to listen to stories over and over and over again that picked up where the other story had closed off. So to me, the short story form is related to oral storytelling in my family. Um, I'm, I'm very inspired by the form. Alice Munro is one of my greatest influences. I love the work of Edward P. Jones and William Trevor. Um, I find the short story form to be such an exquisite um, a form that has a lot of flexibility and that is robust. And the voices that you can include in it are just, it's, you can have so much room to move around in the short story form. Women's voices need to be heard because we are human beings. And I think um, people, for some reason, we still are a subgroup of human beings. And my, you know, my subjectivity as a woman, it never occurred to me that I should write a book about men. I have five sisters and I, I always got the oral history in my family from women. So at no point in my life did I ever stop to think, Oh, I should, I should write really about men more. Um, women's voices need to be heard just for the fact that we are human and our stories and our lives matter. I think a lot about the fact that I came to publish a book from a background that wouldn't necessarily be considered um, the most mainstream pathway to life as an author. As I said earlier, I'm a high school dropout. I'm somebody who went to a state college. I didn't even know that you could study creative writing um, 
as a master's degree or a PhD until the final semester of my undergraduate year. Um, to me, ingenuity in the arts means not all of us have been given very privileged lives where we're able to stop working and just focus on our writing. Um, we don't have very many um, spaces within our homes sometimes. I wrote a lot of the stories in Sabrina and Karina at public libraries in um, the conference rooms. I wrote the story Sabrina and Karina in my parents' basement in an old workroom that had been converted to a bedroom. I wrote on the buses and airplanes and anywhere I could because I didn't really have my own office or any space to write in. Um, and I think that's ingenuity, being able to create a way to, to write and to have an artistic path, even when the world is telling you that it's going to be very difficult and it maybe isn't necessarily for you. I think that it is for all of us. We can all choose to have an artistic path and we can all choose to become writers, but it does take a lot of ingenuity if the cards are sort of stacked against you and you have to find a way to push through and write your work. One of the things I'm known for writing is about place. And I've had such a pleasurable experience being able to build the worlds that I write in and being able to imagine these cities and imagine these lives and imagine these characters. And I think there's a great deal of um, logical world building of, um, there's a great deal of like reflecting back and taking your memories and trying to decide what is the story here? Where do I find the heart, the beating heart of this story and how do I present it to other people so it's entertaining and they learn from it and it's artful? And I think that's what all of us are doing as artists and storytellers is we're searching for truth and we're trying to find a way to present it in a way that keeps readers reading and keeps them turning pages. For a lot of us, we are given official stories that come down through our history classrooms and our English classrooms where we are told that this is the most important novel, this is what happened, this is the official history. And it's important to listen to other voices because truth can be subjective. And if we don't expose our ourselves to a number of different voices and viewpoints, we can sort of get locked in to thinking that this is the only way. And unfortunately, if you come from a background like mine, where it's not the majority culture, or you didn't really see yourselves in those books or in the, in the history textbooks, you're not going to be able to, um, you're not gonna be able to imagine your subjectivity in those spaces. And you're not going to be able to um, imagine yourself into history and imagine yourself into a future. Throughout history, we've always been faced with uncertainty. And what gives me hope is that the artists and the creators, they keep striving for justice. They never give up. Generation after generation, people have made great strides to make justice and change within their communities. Um, and that really gives me hope. And also just seeing new creations being birthed, seeing new novels published, new stories, and seeing more and more writers from backgrounds like mine that weren't officially uh, the, mar the most majority culture, seeing their stories coming out and seeing more and more getting through the gate gives me hope um, that tomorrow can be better and that our future as a country can be more whole and more equitable and more rounded. In my book, Sabrina and Karina, one of the story sisters was set in the 1950s, and it's based on a great, great auntie of mine who was blinded by a man. In the story, she does not receive justice for what happened. I am now three generations later writing short stories about it in an act to seek some sort of justice. But no, I don't think that by writing that we are able to seek justice. I think that we need to keep acting on all fronts and trying to change policy and change our viewpoint and change our understanding of other lives in the world. And with that, we might be able to move toward more justice in this country. I hope readers learn from Sabrina and Karina that you can tell stories that are both heartbreaking and sad, but also filled with humor and light and positivity and resilience. I also hope readers will learn about the place where I come from, Denver, Colorado, and I hope they'll learn about my culture and my ancestors, Chicanas of indigenous ancestry from the American West, and I hope they'll learn about the lives of women and girls from the American West, from this place, and I hope they'll see that the working class, people who are not the educated elite, their lives belong in literature and they should be centered. 
I think humor is something that's built into my culture. I think it's built into our storytelling traditions and the way we tell jokes and the way we um, share gossip with one another. I think humor is just one of the most vital aspects of life. If you can't laugh at yourself, I don't know how you're supposed to keep going forward. Um, yeah, I think humor does round out sort of some of the pain that we experience. And within every moment, you can sort of look to see where is the positivity. And humor also serves to be able to spotlight some of the absurdities that we experience. Because sometimes some of the injustice is so, it's just so bizarre and so hard to understand that in a way it's itself, it's not funny, but sometimes it is, it's humorous how, how the names of neighborhoods in Denver have been changed from the North side to the Highlands, or it's humorous how they think that this is, this is okay. I wrote Sabrina and Karina for almost 10 years. Uh, my first published story was in 2010. I faced a lot of rejection. I was not able to get a book deal for almost seven years. Um, my stories, I had a, a countless, countless rejections for my stories. I was told that they were all the same or that the, the lives of these people didn't make sense to certain readers. And so it felt like a very long process. And I think that Sabrina and Karina being honored with something like the National Book Award or the National Book Award finalist spot is such an incredible honor, but I feel as though my people and my readers catapulted the book to that level. Um, being on this trajectory, I've been on it my whole life and I'm just, I am so proud that I get to be a voice in American letters now, especially because when I was coming up in literature, there was not a voice like mine. And I hope that young, young writers or writers of any age who feel like their stories should be told, they can look at Sabrina and Karina and say, wow, I can write a book like this and it can be celebrated on the national stage, on the international stage, and it can be honored with some of the greatest, um, the greatest honors that our country um, bestows upon books. Um, so yeah, it's been such a, it's been a wonderful journey. I, I can't wait to keep publishing novels that are set here in Colorado in the greater Southwest. And I just love being able to give Chicanas um, from Denver such a huge spotlight in the world of literature. I, I mean, I feel that this is, um, I feel that the revolution that's sort of happening right now, um, it's a symptom of so much injustice that's been plaguing our country since, since its inception. And I, I hope that we can keep pressing and pushing on these fronts in order to make change for the generations that are coming behind us. Um, I feel as though that these can be very positive changes and we're already seeing incredibly positive changes that are coming out of these protests. Um, and just for all the young people out there and everyone who's out there that's hitting the streets and protesting and writing their governor and writing their lawmakers, thank you so much for using your voice to show we matter and that justice and change is possible.